Wonderful. Okay. Well, in the interest of time, and it seems like everybody is out of the waiting room, I'd like to go ahead and get started. Uh, so good morning again, and welcome to this, the second to last science seminar of the year brought to you by the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center, also known as CCASC. And our goal again for these virtual gatherings is to provide a platform to highlight and discuss research that supports resource management across the Southeast. My name is Michelle Jewell, and I'm the Communications and Engagement Manager for the Southeast CAS, and I'm joined today by Kristen Fontana, an ORISE Science Communication Fellow with us here as well. First, we're going to start today with uh, meeting logistics, request your feedback via a short poll in just a minute, and then introduce our speaker, Yoichiro Kano. They'll present for roughly 40 minutes, leaving time for Q&A and discussion at the end. And now Kristen is gonna give you a quick overview of how to engage with us today here on Zoom. Yeah, so I'm just going to quickly cover some of the Zoom features that we're using for today's webinar. I'm sure we're all pretty familiar, but we do recognize that people use different technologies. So I'm just going to point out a couple of things. The controls on the bottom left of your Zoom screen allow you to mute and unmute your audio. We will keep all lines muted and also ask that you also keep your video off so that we can reduce distractions during the presentation. In the middle of the bottom bar, you can access the chat window, and I encourage you if questions come up during the presentation to submit them in the chat for discussion after the talk. We will be monitoring questions there, and we'll post them to our speakers during the Q&A session. We will also be recording today's webinar, and you can access and share the recording afterwards on the Southeast CAS website, on our Science Seminars webpage, and also on our YouTube channel. Now we're going to launch a short poll just to get a bit of information about who is with us today and help us understand how we can continue to get information out about these seminars. And we'll give you about a half a minute or so to fill it out. Okay, and I'll share the results here. Thank you everyone for filling this out and for feeding back this information. It's so great to see the breadth of folks in our audience today, which sets us up for a robust discussion about this research. Now we'll turn over to our presentation, and while we switch screen sharing, I will introduce our speaker. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, Yoichiro Kano. Yoichiro Kano is an associate professor in the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Conservation Biology at Colorado State University. His research focuses on stream fish population and community ecology, global change biology, quantitative ecology, and conservation genetics, and he also teaches courses in fish conservation ecology and river sustainability. The title of his presentation is Climate Change Impacts on Brook Trout Populations in the Southeastern USA. Now I'll turn it over to you, Yorichiro. All right, well, I'll start um, yeah, sharing the screen. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks so much for your time today. All right, so let's, let's get uh, going. And uh, so first of all, I would like to acknowledge funding agencies, uh, CCAS and the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the number of uh, colleagues from academic institutions, uh, federal and the state agencies. And um, particularly, I'm going to acknowledge uh, Lucy Liu and uh, George Valentine, uh, who have done the heavy lifting of the work I'm going to present today. And I'll start with the uh, brook trout basics. So this species is native to um, the eastern and midwestern USA and the farther north to Canada. Now, trout fishing is a multi-billion dollar industry in the USA. Uh, north Carolina estimated an economic benefit of trout fishing at nearly $400 million in uh, about a decade ago. Brook trout are often considered an indicator of high quality cold water streams. And in fact, their scientific name, uh, Salvilinus fontinalis, uh, indicates small salmon in fountains or springs uh, fed by groundwater. So belonging to genus Salvilinus, uh, it's really a, a char, uh, although uh, brook trout is often used as, as a common, uh, common name. And this is the only native trout in the Southeast. And many communities think that Brook trout are part of what define their natural and cultural uh, heritage. So where did uh, and do uh, brook trout occur? Uh, here is the map showing historic brook trout distribution in brown and current distribution in green uh, in the USA. And uh, once again, uh, their distribution extends to Canada uh, all the way to uh, Newfoundland, uh, Quebec. Uh, and today, 
I will focus on the southeast uh, from Georgia to Maryland, circled in red on this map. Zooming in, zooming in further, uh, here's a map showing conservation status of brook trout in the eastern USA. Uh, on this map, you, you see three uh, different colors. And gray means local extinction, red is severe decline, and green means brookies are doing okay. So as you see on the map, brook trout have declined range-wide, particularly in the southern and central uh, Appalachian Mountains regions. And brook trout, where they occur, or they still occur, are relegated to headwaters, uh, typically in very small population size. So brook trout is very interesting because it's a species of conservation concern that is also a recreationally important species. And this species is actually designated as the state fish in nine out of the 16 states uh, where you see uh, here. So my talk, to, uh, again, uh, will focus on this uh, southern uh, central uh, range uh, uh, of a brook trout uh, distribution in the USA. So threats to brook trout are many, including habitat loss and fragmentation, uh, competition with non-native species, uh, particularly rainbow trout in the southeast. And hybridization with stocked fish has also been a concern. And the genetic purity is often uh, a metric to uh, um, judge uh, the conservation value of uh, trout uh, populations and water quality from point and non-point sources. And for cold water species at the southern range, climate change is no doubt a key threat. And as we've experienced, uh, air temperatures are rising as evidenced by the last nine years being the warmest on record. And it's likely that 2023 will make it 10 years in a row. Not surprisingly, stream temperatures are also uh, on the rise in the USA and globally. Now, brook trout don't withstand uh, warm temperatures and their uh, thermal threshold is around 21 to 22 degrees in Celsius or approximately 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And at, hot, at the higher temperatures, not only does direct mortality occur, but also indirect effects um, such as delayed uh, uh, spawning, competitive uh, exclusions do occur uh, with the non-native species. And in addition, precipitation patterns are also changing, uh, which will change stream flow patterns. This map shows temporal changes in annual and seasonal precipitation patterns in the USA. The study region uh, marked uh, in black in the upper uh, panel um, has become wetter on an annual scale. But as you can see in the seasonal maps, there's much seasonal variation and study area is expected to become drier in summer and wetter in other seasons. So here's what we know about how altered flows may affect brook trout life cycle. Brook trout are fall spawners and their eggs incubate uh, in the stream bed until they hatch in early spring. And they, they grow to young weir or yoi, Y-O-Y, in summer when many agencies conduct their field work. Brook trout are short-lived uh, with a lifespan of two to four years. And then this uh, spawning uh, cycle begins again. And their early life stages are vulnerable to higher flows uh, due to their weak swimming uh, abilities. Thus, floods or high winter flows and spring flows typically result in low young weir abundance in the in the following summer or in that in that summer and this is also one biological mechanisms how um, altered flow may lead to life stage specific responses to climate change because adults are less vulnerable to high flows than yoi because they they can swim much better and they, they can find refugia so you know i feel like we know quite a bit about climate change impacts on trout populations already. So why are we um, working on this project? And so far, I would argue that our knowledge comes from analysis of individual data sets 
in a relatively small region. And we don't know yet um, if climate change will affect all populations similarly or not in a large region such as the Southeast. And then this degree of spatial synchrony has conservation implications because landscape level planning and prioritization such as identifying climate refugia in the Southeast only makes sense if spatial heterogeneity is high. So this is why uh, we wanted to compile and analyze a trout and the stream temperature data in the Southeast to characterize the degree of spatial uh, heterogeneity. Uh, these two maps show locations of data spanning over um, about um, uh, 1,000 kilometers of linear habitat range. And I will explain each data set more fully later. But here, um, I wanted to mention that our study area expanded beyond the sea cask jurisdiction and went um, as far north as, as Maryland, uh, Maryland. So with that uh, long introduction, <laughs> I guess, um, I wanted to uh, present the, uh, the structure of my talk today. Um, I have three um, components of my talk today. First, I will talk about uh, analysis of temperature data to characterize spatial heterogeneity in uh, warming and identify uh, thermal refugia. And second, um, I will quantify spatial uh, population synchrony using space-time count data. Finally, I will evaluate if seasonal uh, weather patterns, seasonal weather impacts on trout populations have changed uh, over time. So let's dive into the first objective. U.S. Forest Service, um, led by Andy Doloff, uh, collected paired stream air temperature data using remote logar, uh, remote hobo log uh, loggers at 203 sites. So on the picture here, and um, I don't know if you can see the the, the cursor. Uh, um, yeah, but uh, on the picture here, uh, you see a white PVC case hanging in the air uh, with a temp logger inside. And you also see this uh, green rope uh, into the river, which is also connected to another PVC case with a logger inside. So th these, these are how the paired uh, data were collected. And loggers recorded air and stream temperature every 30 minutes. And all data were collected from brook drought streams in, in the region. And when we looked at these data, we immediately noticed that the thermal regimes differ quite a bit among sites. Here are plots of weekly mean stream temperature against weekly air temperatures at two representative sites. The stream temperatures on the left is buffered against air temperature increase, maintaining a stable thermal regime year round, thanks to groundwater input and the, uh, the stream temperature on the right is highly responsive to uh, air temperature variation. So immediately we no noticed that, wow, there's a great deal of spatial variation among these sites. And we, we fit nonlinear regression uh, to this relationship for each of the 203 study sites. And this nonlinear regression uh, is appropriate because it, our stream temperatures rarely uh, go below zero degrees Celsius. And it also kind of plateaus at higher ends too because uh, due to uh, evaporative cooling. So this is a logistic regression method, basically, uh, where the minimum uh, stream temperature is shown in mu and the max value is the, the alpha. And we were primarily interested in beta or the regression slope. And its ecological interpretation is um, how much weekly water temperature increases when air temperature increases by one degree Celsius at the inflection point, which is the middle area in the sigmoidal or S-shaped curve. And this is what the spatial distributions of thermal sensitivity or beta looks like. The values of beta uh, range between uh, 0.25 uh, to a little over one with lower values indicating more thermally buffered sites or thermal refugia. And thermal refugia appear to concentrate in the south. And then this result may seem counterintuitive, but then we think that this is due to higher altitude of sites in the southern uh, south compared to the north. 
The mean altitude in the southern half of the study area is approximately 900 meters above sea level, whereas it is about 450 meters uh, um, uh, above sea levels in the northern, northern half. So our question, our next question then was, why does this spatial heterogeneity exist? And whether we can explain this spatial heterogeneity using readily available coarse scale habitat data. So we turned to um, National Hydrography uh, Dataset, or NHD+, which store habitat data at the stream segment scale, uh, which is defined from stream confluence to stream confluence. In our data set, the mean, um, mean stream segment uh, length was 2.8 kilometers. So we are trying to um, understand thermal heterogeneity at a fairly fine scale. And we used 174 habitat variables uh, in, in, the, uh, in the NHD. And then I will mention that the um, NHD plus uh, has the great spatial coverage, uh, perhaps at the expense of our uh, fine scale habitat data. So it's likely that we will miss uh, spatial heterogeneity within stream segments, such as localized groundwater input and mesohabitat diversity. However, it still represents the best available data set at this spatial extent. So we, we ran the PCA, the principal component analysis of the 174 habitat variables to consolidate the data and fit a Bayesian, Bayesian hierarchical model where the first five principal components explain 17% of the variation in regression slopes among sites. So the exper exploratory power uh, was moderate, but according to this model, the thermal refugia are more likely to occur at southern latitude or higher altitude, at southern latitudes at higher elevation, where higher base flow index occurred, which is a index of a groundwater input at smaller watershed and at stream segments with lower channel gradient, which we think represents uh, some, uh, some sort of a fluvial geomorphology. So while acknowledging the caveat that moderate predictive power is um, uh, provided by this model, we still use the model to predict thermal sensitivity of all brook trout stream segments in our study uh, area. That's about 8,600 segments. And you will notice some clusters of thermally buffered sites. So one uh, over here in the south, but also uh, on the eastern uh, side of uh, West Virginia, and uh, Maryland as well. And I should note that these spatial clusters are partly due to spatial interpolation, um, which smooth these spatial patterns. But then if you look at the raw data, there's also definitely these um, clusters of um, highly buffered sites. So I don't think this is completely, um, you know, this may be an incomplete, I mean, this, may, this prediction may not be uh, perfect, but I don't think it's the, you know, complete um, um, artifacts um, uh, either. So what did we learn uh, from the objective one? There was much thermal variation over space and for scale eight uh, GIS data have limited power to explain the spatial variation, which was not uh, too surprising. So let's move on to the uh, second part. And I'll, I'll talk more about the trout itself. So let's look at the population synchrony now. Now, um, the idea here is that, you know, there's a lot of count data collected by state and the federal agencies, and we wanted to use the best use of it. So agencies collect mostly two types of data. One is called multi-pass depletion data or multi-pass electrofishing data, which allows estimation of capture probability through depletion or removal method, and thus allow um, thus abundance estimation. And the second one is a single pass method to obtain an index of relative abundance. And the electro, uh, electrofishing surveys are commonly done at many sites by many agencies, with some sites uh, resampled re multiple times um, uh, across the years. So, so the data are spatially and temporally uh, replicated. 
And this map shows the locations of the 145 stream segments with five years or more of data collected by multi-pass method. So basically, these are the best of the best data. And I will use this horizontal line at 37 degrees north uh, to separate the study area into north and the south subregions on the uh, following slides. And space-time count data contain much demographic information. So from this data, we can quantify metrics such as mean abundance, temporal trend, variation, but also synchrony, which I'm going to discuss today. So what is synchrony? It is similarity in temporal trends um, among sites. And synchrony among sites dampens variation at the regional scale. And this is often referred to as portfolio effect. And that's probably most famous for the um, uh, Sokai salmon in Alaska's Bristol Bay. And we thought that understanding population synchrony is important for landscape conservation of brook trout to identify a portfolio of conservation con uh, uh, populations along the synchrony gradient. Now, assume a time series of count data at the single site shown here. Now, there are fluctuations in time account. Uh, uh, there are fluctuations in trout count as a function of time as a random effect here. And let's consider multiple sites in the region. In this example, there are three completely synchronous populations represented by parallel lines. And these dynamics can be represented by time and site effects because intercepts basically shift up and, uh, upward or downward. The actual count data just look like more like a spaghetti plot. So here, uh, red and black sites have more, more or less similar trends, but the blue site does not. And analytically, these space-time dynamics can be explained by adding an interactive term between time and site. So time main effect, site main effect, and their interaction. And then doing or decomposing the variation this way, we can characterize population synchrony by using intra-class correlation coefficient, or ICC. Now, this is temporal variation divided by sum of temporal variation and uh, space-time variation. So if the space-time variation is high, the denominator becomes large, resulting in a small ICC value close to zero, meaning asynchrony. But if the space-time variance is zero, lines are in perfect parallel with ICC values equal to one. So we estimated ICC in um, N mixture modeling framework. And analysis was conducted for young of your fish and adults separately. So our data uh, or count data Y indexed by site, pass, and the ER for our life stage specific trout count obtained by multi-pass depletion data. And we also assumed that trout capture probability may differ by data source or the agency. So we accounted for that uh, in our model. And finally, here's how uh, ICC was estimated as explained on the previous slides. So on the next slide, I'm going to show the distributions of ICC values in the Southeast. And here's the map. And I have two um, notes to make here. So first, most of ICC values are less than 0.5, meaning that asynchrony is very high in our data. And this high level of asynchrony was similarly observed in adults, although uh, the, this uh, uh, ICC values shown are for young of your fish. And second, the most synchronous or uh, uh, most asynchronous segments shown by these plus signs occurred at the southern and northern ends, which also coincides with the locations of thermal refugia. I mean, that's an interesting observation, but this linkage should be further examined. And then we may have the asynchronous sites at the uh, periphery of the study's um, sites, because you know if there's a, a gradient, environmental gradient here, you would likely to see most, uh, most asynchronous sites on the 
either end of the gradient. And also interestingly, um, we found population asynchrony or high population asynchrony despite high synchrony in seasonal temperature and precipitation. Uh, this figure shows uh, a corridogram where correlation coefficient is shown on the y-axis against pairwise distance between sites on the x-axis. You see seasonal weather covariates such as winter flow, uh, summer temperature, uh, winter precipitation, and the YOY density, um, adult density, and seasonal weather covariates are highly correlated between sites, especially if they are close to each other geographically. And correlation is much lower for trout data, which is another way to present evidence for population asynchrony uh, in this uh, data set. And Another question we also uh, sought uh, was to understand why are population asynchronous despite synchrony in abiotic conditions? And here's a you know, graphical sketch of how trout density is affected. And we assumed that the spatial population in, um, asynchrony could occur because the effect of seasonal weather covariates are not uniform across space. So things like temperature flows might not affect populations of brook trout uniformly across the space. So we wanted to investigate uh, that hypothesis next. So we again uh, went to the end mixture model to quantify effect of seasonal weather covariate. And as a reminder from the, the brook trout life cycle, uh, thermal stress occurs primarily in summer for trout and winter and spring corresponds uh, with the early life stages when they are susceptible uh, to uh, high flows. And then we modified N mixture model, uh, instead of uh, calculating uh, ICC with random effects, we incorporate these seasonal covariates and analyze the data by region, uh, north versus south, to see if the regions differ in their responses to seasonal weather covariates. And we found that populations indeed differ in how they respond to seasonal weather variation in north versus the south. The plot shows posterior distributions of effect size of each covariate uh, by north and the south regions separately and both regions combined. High temperature, a uh, high summer temperature and high winter spring flow had negative effects, meaning that High temperature and high flows led to lower YOY abundance, but these effects varied by region. So for example, if you look at the summer temperature, the summer temperature's effect was much higher in the south as their posterior distribution barely overlapped with zero. In the meantime, in the, uh, the flows affected the populations in the north more than the populations in the south. So the patterns of flow and temperature effect almost got switched between the regions in the sense that temperature is more important driver in the south, whereas flow are the more important drivers in the north. So we covered quite a bit here, but then the, the objective to take away is that Populations are asynchronous, although previous analysis of individual data sets showed high degrees of synchrony when the analysis was confined to smaller geographic extent. And then this asynchrony was due to spatially heterogeneous population responses to seasonal weather variation. And this was the first um, region-wide attempt, I would say, to go beyond presence-absence data. And then this was uh, beautifully done as a uh, MS thesis by George Valentine. And uh, this paper actually came out just last week in uh, Global Change Biology, uh, for those of you um, who are interested in knowing the, the, the more technical details. So um, here's the last component of my talk. I want to evaluate if uh, the weather patterns or weather impacts on trout populations have changed um, over time. So we are interested in temporally dynamic effects of weather covariates. And we wanted to 
specifically test two ideas here. The, the first one is that you know, we thought that effective weather covariates may be mitigated or amplified bother by other covariates. For example, more summer rain may mitigate negative impact of high temperature as shown by this uh, paper in Merriam uh, 2017. And we also thought the disturbances, whether it's a drought or flood, may have lasting effects over multiple years. So for example, floods may configure, reconfigure the stream habitat and may have a lasting effect. And then of course, biologically, drought populations need generation time or the recovery time to recover from disturbances. So we wanted to test these ideas using a latent trajectory process and a functional regression. So once again, uh, and if, well, we picked two uh, variates here, uh, two covariates here, summer temperature and the winter flow that have um, persistently shown the effect on trout abundance, particularly for young of year fish. But then we also thought that their effect might be regulated by hidden drivers, that is summer precipitation and the winter flood for the winter mean. Of, uh, so the um, summer temperature and the winter flow are the mean uh, values. And then winter floods is the uh, extremely high um, channel reconfiguring um, scale uh, flood that occurred in winter. And notably, summer temperature and the precipitations were not correlated with, the, uh, with each other. And the same thing goes between the winter flow and the winter, fl uh, winter flood. And for this uh, complex analysis, uh, we chose uh, one data set um, for, uh, from the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which was one of the richest data of spatial and temporal coverage managed and maintained meticulously by uh, Matt Kalk. And this data set included 84 sites spanning 35 year uh, period between 1980 and uh, 2015. So I want to talk about a latent process, a latent trajectory process. process. Um, it is a spatial, uh, spatial temporal point process where imperfectly observed or unobserved states of something change deterministically uh, or stochastic and stochastically. So here in this um, hypothetical space, you see this point moves along the north and south gradient with some random walks. And this model development uh, was led by Lucy and Mevin. And then applying this concept to brook trout, we can think that a particular stream segment or a particular population undergoes between the resilient and sensitive states to climate var covariates. And then the drivers turn off or on that switch to go between the resilient and the sensitive states. So this graph shows how a single site transitions between resilient and sensitive states over three time step with probability of state changes shown by Rio. And we also wanted to limit the number of state transitions because ecological tipping points that cause, uh, that cause state changes are rare and infrequent. And for that, uh, we use Bayesian regularization method to limit the number of state changes, uh, which I won't go over today. So I will focus on the latent trajectory process. And we, again, uh, used n mixture model as our base fra basic framework uh, for analysis. So uh, for count data, a y indexed by site pass and year, you know, this model is identical to what you saw um, pre previously. But the key change was that we let weather effect conditional on the uh, on the drivers. So this theta value was conditional on the on the drivers in in a hierarchical manner. And the way we implemented um, this latent trajectory process was that we consider that climate covariates influence drought abundance only when sites are in the sensitive states. So here the states is either one or zero, depending on sensitive or resilient. And their weather effect is 
present only when the state when when the population is in a sensitive state or otherwise zero. So this Rio, the state transition probability um, is composed of initial conditions and driver effect and the random effect. And you notice that there are two terms in the driver effect. And this latter term refers to the time lasting effect of driver. And what, what do I mean by that? We assume that the major disturbances like last year would have a larger effect than disturbances that occurred five years ago, okay? So we could look at the effect size of the um, disturbances to decay with time. And that's what this uh, uh, EXP or the exponential decay uh, function uh, means at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the top. So we basically let the effect of disturbances to decay with time and then quantified their cumulative effects um, over time in this uh, functional regression approach. So what did we found? The driver uh, and these uh, this plots show 95%, I'm sorry, the uh, critical, uh, um, these plots show the posterior, posterior distributions of the driver effects uh, on sensitivity. And the only significant effect uh, we detected was the negative effect of summer temperature uh, on adult sensitivity, meaning that adult abundance was more resilient when it rained more in the summer or the pre previous summers. We did not find the winter flood effect on uh, um, yoi or adult sensitivity. And then we can also look um, time average sensitivity values by life stage and weather covariates. And, and once again, the overarching theme today is the spatial heterogeneity. So I wanted to kind of show this pattern uh, by space. And here you see sensitivity of Y and adults to summer temperature and winter flow. Cooler colors indicate more resiliency. Warmer colors, uh, warmer colors indicate more sensitivity. So once again, there's evidence that spatial heterogeneous, heterogeneous uh, trout population responses to uh, climate change variation do occur even at a relatively smaller uh, spatial scale within the park. And then we can also um, consolidate this uh, information and digest it uh, more readily by averaging the sensitivity values from these four maps to generate an overall sensitivity map. Um, here, uh, we can see where more resilient and sensitive sites may be located in the park boundary with the less sensitive or more robust sites um, occur, are located at the southern end of the park boundary, uh, located um, as indicated by the Kura colors uh, in the southern end. And this is also one way to, you know, we're trying to uh, use multiple metrics um, to represent the robustness or, uh, or sensitivity to climate change. So uh, we're still working on uh, how we kind of think about combining metrics, but here's kind of one way uh, to uh, combine metrics to come up with an overall kind of score um, of um, robustness or sensitivity uh, to, uh, to climate change. So number three takeaway, uh, the objective three takeaway, um, you know, seasonal weather covariates uh, interacted with each other to affect trout abundance. We we only saw that pattern between the summer temperature and the summer precipitation, but we still think understanding the, that type of interaction is very important because we don't know much about how weather covariates interact with, e with each other and how that interactions are uh, uh, spatially structured. And this analysis showed another, yet another sign of spatial variation in trout responses to climate change. And we are developing a set of novel statistical approaches and uh, this is one of them and uh, more to come before we wrap up the uh, the project. So overall takeaway, um, I think it really comes down to spatial heterogeneity, meaning that not all streams uh, respond similarly to climate change. And this is a new insight which could not have been gained by analysis of individual data sets. And in terms of uh, brook trout conservation, 
there is this spatial heterogeneity means that rook trout will more likely persist in some streams than others. And some populations will likely persist for a long time, even at the southern range. So I think our set of analysis shows um, we can be uh, cautiously optimistic um, about the future of the uh, brook trout in the southeast. Um, at least um, we were going to have some of them um, persisting uh, in the warming or changing climate. And at the beginning of my talk, I stated that spatial heterogeneity is a prerequisite to conducting spatial prioritization exercise. And we see much spatial heterogeneity in indicating the need and justification for spatial prioritization at the regional scale. So ideally, this is where we want to go to. We like to locate where climate uh, refugia uh, exist for brook trout in the southeast. Today, um, I showed analysis of temperature and trout count data, but, but conceptually, you know, we would like to add other metrics, um, you know, GIS data, such as habitat patch size, uh, to identify uh, climate refugia. And moving forward, um, we are uh, wrapping up uh, this CCASP grant in summer of 2024. So we are now looking at um, trout count data available in the Southeast, all of them, um, whether it's a single pass or multi-pass data uh, to characterize the spatial temporal variation. And we are also building upon our successful Southeast experience to go farther north into Maine uh, uh, for range-wide analysis. Uh, we have received a new grant from uh, US Fish and uh, Wildlife Service uh, through their multi-state conservation program to conduct this uh, uh, range-wide analysis um, starting next year. And one final thing I'd like to mention um, is the, um, the strength of this project rest on the partnership with, the, with trout managers. So we interact with trout managers individually and via fora, such as Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture, which is one of the national habitat, uh, fish habitat partnerships. And the Southern Division AFS also has a trout technical committee, which is a great springboard for um, ideas and data. And I also want to mention Jake, uh, Jake Rash, as he has been instrumental in bridging science and the management. And he's a um, cold water research uh, coordinator uh, with the uh, NC uh, North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. But um, you know he's one guy uh, who thinks not only about his local resources, but also the resources range-wide. So it's really um, helpful um, to have um, that type of a uh, uh, range-wide view um, uh, for this um, process. And you know, trout managers provide data and feedback, and then this project would not have existed unless they were willing to share their data and ideas. And I also would say that you know, scientific products of this project would not be as useful unless understood and used by trout managers. So, um, I mean, I, I, you know, I can probably talk um, quite a bit just on this slide, but then uh, one kind of take home our lesson we learned is that uh, this type of partnership uh, is very important. And I hope this partnership continues through the life of the project and beyond. And I think with that, um, this concludes my talk. And I would like to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge my uh, funding agencies and partners once again. And I will answer questions as uh, time allows. Wonderful. Thank you so much for a brilliant talk. I was saying to Yoichiro, I'm a huge fish fan, so this has really satisfied my, my fishy cravings um, for some science knowledge here. So thank you for that. We have loads of questions in the chat. We just went through a lot of the questions and they're mostly ecosystem related. Uh, uh, so you're in the hot seat for most of the questions here. Oh, okay. So Josh Kelly has a question about stream uh, gradient and whether it was evaluated as a possible influence on young of year populations? Yeah, so uh, we we did not, but then you're right. Um, the the mechanism, bi biological mechanism here for the 
impact on the early life stages is the bed scouring. So stream power to scour the bed has to happen. And that could happen by both the uh, volume of water, but also the gradient too. But I'm also skeptical if the NHD level gradient may give us that uh, fine scale uh, scouring. Uh, we might have to have a better or finer scale understanding of uh, the channel gradient, uh, maybe measured in uh, in situ, uh, to to get at that question. But but I think you're right. I think that's the kind of mechanisms that might lead to spatially heterogeneous, heterogeneous uh, responses. And Brad Taylor has sort of a not really directly related to that, but kind of similar question about scale. So. Um, how relevant are the point measures of water temperature? Um, right. And there's, there's another um, one below apparently related to that. But uh, uh -huh. there, for example, yeah. there are lots of temperature variation within two kilometers length of the stream. Uh -huh. Yes. So, so is water uh, temperature measured at a finer spatial scale? Yeah, we, we always talk about the fine scale groundwater input uh, in this type of uh, analysis. And uh, we are likely to, so, so there are errors, to, there are types of errors we commit, right? So if we have a point estimate of temperature, and if we are lucky enough to identify climate refugia, that climate refugia is likely to exist. But then there is another type of error where we miss the climate refugia because of the spatial heterogeneity. So, I think you know finding climate refugia. So, uh, so the what's the one Mevin like negative, positive poles is positive poles are unlikely to occur, but negative poles are potentially happening. And then for this type of analysis, we do need uh, more loggers or uh, like a fiber optic cable that can um, te um, measure the stream temperature at the final spatial gradient. Um, that would be needed. And uh, there's also a group in the USGS uh, with uh, Ben Letcher, uh, Fan Hit. Uh, they're also using temperature tag uh, to, um, to see if fish are using localized groundwater uh, uh, refugia. And uh, those more uh, concentrated efforts are needed. But then again, you know, we're always kind of balancing the um, intensive local scale effort versus uh, broad scale landscape effort, right? Um, so we, we need to have somehow find a happy marriage in balancing these two, uh, these two needs. Let me ask you another one from Amy, uh, kind of related to, um, but not related to scale in that sense, but more related to sensitivity of sites. So uh, she says, do any of your analyses explain brook trout persistence in the more sensitive sites, perhaps the summer precipitation, and she's thinking of the dark red sites in the western mm. West Virginia on the slide. Yeah, uh, no, we haven't looked at that yet. Um, so our next work or the eventual work uh, is that we need to integrate temperature data and population data together, and then come up with a way to link these um, uh, different analyses. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, we spend a lot of time um, cleaning the data, analyzing the data so far, and I feel like we're at the stage where we need to um, inter or interpret the data, communicate uh, what this science means to management. So, yeah, so, I mean, it's a kind of long answer to uh, uh, to saying that we haven't done it yet. <laughs> Yeah, and she she also brought up the same point about within site thermal heterogeneity. So how important that is to yeah better, like select conservation regions and things like that. Right. Yeah, I mean the behavioral thermal regulation happens. I mean we all know that we've seen. I think you know trout congregate in areas of localized groundwater input uh, like a uh, seepage. Um, so yeah, it, it does happen. But then the utility of this. Um, landscape type work is that you know we were able to identify several like clusters of potential climate refugia and then you know use that as the initial filter and then use more detailed um um you know effort to identify 
you know, which particular stream in that area is really functioning as climate refugia. And, you know, it's not just the behavior, it could also, you know, be the fish movement, you know, genetics, effective population size. Um, so yeah, we, there are tools uh, to make our, a more integrative assessment. There's two other, I thought, really good questions. Well, there's several good ones, but just to, I know we're limited on time. So let me ask you a couple of these other ones. Um, what Here's one on the asynchronous um, population. So what will the impact of asynchronous populations on management of brook trout? Uh, specifically yes. in reintroductions and translocations. Right, right. So um, one thing um, that uh, I've talked to um, trout managers is that the if we are talking about a um, fishable populations of brook trout, uh, this could mean that the asynchrony could mean that a mobile, you know, predators like anglers uh, are able to. Um, move from one site one ER and another site in another ER uh, to continue fishing and be happy, right? Um, so, so that's kind of one way uh, to, to think about um, how resources uh, may stabilize at, at, the, at the regional scale. But then from the conservation perspective too, if you think about a meta populations that are connected by gene flow or movement, this could also, increase the chance of meta population persistence um, just because of the asynchrony. Like not all of the you know, segments of that or populations will be hit at the same time, right? So, so I think that will have a uh, more stabilizing effects on the meta population persistence over time. Uh, and there are some papers that conceptually show that. Mevin, you're muted there. Are but we still good on time there, Michelle? We've got or we... like less than a minute here. So if there's a, a maybe it's best if we just wrap it up, I guess. All right, great. Thank you for your co-hosting assistance here, Mevin. I appreciate it. <laughs> Two things to plug is we do have an upcoming uh, talk in December um, with Jacob, who I think is on the call. I think I saw Jacob come in uh, to talk about the results from the Southeast for the Southeast from the 2022 AFWA Climate Adaptation Survey Report. There's gonna be a link coming to you in the chat uh, to go ahead and register for that if you'd like to join us on December 13th at 11 a.m. during Eastern time. And also if you would like to keep updated uh, with all of our events that are coming up, including our spring semester talks that are soon to be announced, those are all in our newsletter. That link is coming to you in the chat as well please feel free to subscribe to that newsletter. And, and all thank you again. This is one of our uh, wonderfully attended science seminars and a, a, another round of applause and thanks um, for the wonderful talk about Brook Trout today. We appreciate you and all of you for being able to turn out today and join us for the science seminar. And we hope to see you at the next one. So thanks all, the recording will be posted soon and we'll be in contact.